Hello, my name is Dr. Gerard Toll, and I am a professor at Virginia Tech School of Public International Affairs. And this particular lecture is in my discourse analysis class for fall 2019. And it's the first of two lectures on theorizing discourse in the age of Trump. So the first a lecture here is going to address the issue of conspiracism and conspiracy theories. And we're going to discuss this particular book, which is by Russell Muirhead, who is a professor at Dartmouth, and Nancy Rosenblum, who is a professor of uh, politics at Harvard University. Now, you should look at the works that they have previously uh, done. They are uh, theorists. They are also partisans uh, or advocates for the importance of political parties. And so that theme is one that occurs in the, the book. Now, the reason why we're addressing this is that um, we are in a particular age of uh, rampant conspiracy theories. Um, and the conspiracy theories seem to be at the very, very centre of our political life. The term conspiracy theory, the frame conspiracy theory, is uh, it appears at least to be a lot more frequent than it was in the past. And I think that has to do with Trump. Now, um, we need to think about how that frame is used. We need to... Uh, uh, consider the moral panic that uh, goes along with the use of that particular uh, term. Uh, and we need to begin to think about the uh, place of conspiracism and what it is as a discourse within American political life. Now, there's a large literature on uh, conspiracy thinking uh, and um, what some would call irrational psychology in um, American politics and in uh, just looking at the, the theme of um, this abnormal psychology uh, or crippled epistemology, which is the term that Cass Sunstein uses to describe uh, conspiracy theories. Now, the classic is uh, and the, the kind of a work that a lot of people turn to when they're discussing conspiracy theories in American political life is Richard Hofstadter's book, The Paranoid Style in American, uh, in American Politics, which was uh, interested in the John Birch Society. And he was writing it uh, just as JFK had been assassinated. And uh, um, so that in and of itself became a major uh, concern and preoccupation of uh, certain groups within the American political arena in the 1960s and onwards to this day. Um, but the literature on conspiracy theories uh, has uh, continued to um, be quite um, uh, bountiful. Um, this last number uh, of years, it seems as if there's uh, books coming out uh, regularly uh, on conspiracy theories. And so these books, have, uh, these books here have just been published in the last year. Um, and undoubtedly, this is in one sense a function of the mainstreaming of conspiratorial thinking by uh, Donald Trump. Uh, it seems as if conspiracy theories are injected into our culture one tweet at a time from uh, Trump's uh, account. But I think that it is perhaps a mistake to focus on one particular personality, a uh, distinctive and uh, precedent making and norm, a uh, define a uh, norm, norm uh, breaking and iconoclastic as he is. Um, because this is a phenomenon that is um, not particular to the United States. It has a particular uh, expression within the United States, but it's also something that one finds in, in other states. And there's a literature now on uh, conspiracy theories in Russia and how they are part of the sort of technology uh, of governance in Russia, the sort of ideological production of images of the state as a fortress, for example, which is uh, relentlessly under siege by uh, uh, plotting others. 
Uh, that's what Ilya Yablokov uh, looks at, uh, particularly how this is expressed in Russian television. And there are others uh, too in, Ru in Russian literature. Eliot Borenstein uh, looks at this phenomenon too. Um, and various uh, academics have written articles on uh, geopolitical conspiracies. Uh, now, um, w w let's begin with uh, a definition. So uh, a conspiracy theory is essentially a causal explanatory narrative uh, that features a secret plot by powerful people to advance an agenda against the common good. So um, it also can be defined as the unnecessary assumption of conspiracy when other explanations are more probable. Uh, now, there are, there are various um, thinkers who have sought to define conspiracy theories by three axioms. Uh, nothing happens by accident, or there are known unknowns in the world. Nothing is as it seems, and everything is connected, so that the universe is governed by design, not by randomness. And it's that uh, distinction between... Um, uh, allowing chance and uh, attributing coherence and design to uh, events and to processes that distinguishes uh, conspiratorial thinking. But we have to be very careful as to how we define it because the frame itself is part of what we need to study and the use of the frame, the dubbing something a conspiracy theory is a delegitimating tactic um, and that in and of itself is something that uh, we need to be alert to um, and we need to be aware of how, of how a conspiracy theory in and of itself is not something that is uh, indicative of, uh, uh, of damaged psychology uh, or of uh, a particular um, uh, unusual feature of uh, human thought. In, in actuality, the opposite is true, uh, that uh, humans are um, pattern-seeking uh, individuals. Our evolution has depended upon us uh, being skeptical in the world and making connections, making causal um, uh, connections, uh, uh, kind of connecting the dots, so to speak. Uh, and that is, a, is, that is a essential to how humans act. In other words, humans are a natural born conspiracy theorists, as uh, Rob uh, Botherton uh, argues. Uh, and there is, I think, a danger uh, when one looks at conspiracy theories that uh, one focuses in on the abnormal and um, misses the commonplace feature of uh, conspiracy theories. So let's talk uh, a little bit about the cognitive biases which enable conspiracist discourse. Now, human cognition, uh, psychologists have studied this for a long, long time, um, is characterized by certain, um, they, it can be seen as, uh, as biases. Some describe them as uh, uh, sort of dispositions, um, uh, which, are, which mean that we do not think rationally, even though we may think we're thinking rationally. Uh, um, and uh, we have certain dispositions to think in particular ways. Um, so there are three um, cognitive biases that researchers in psychology in particular, but also in cultural studies and now in politics, have, have pointed to as uh, enabling conspiracist discourse. The first of uh, all is intentionality attribution. They, we tend uh, to, when we think uh, about uh, issues and, and problems in the world, we tend to think that certain things happen for a reason. There are certain forces behind things uh, and we often attribute these to particular powerful agents or to uh, scary actors or outgroups which we uh, are afraid of. So there's an intentionality attribution uh, which assigns design when in actuality chaos, uh, accident, um, 
sort of uh, blundering through uh, um, or uh, consequences of consequences which are uh, unanticipated uh, may better account for the phenomenon that we are studying. The second bias is proportionality bias. And that is that we tend to attribute big causes to big events. So the classic case is JFK and the fact that uh, that being such a momentous, horrible event had to be attributed to more than simply a single gunman who decided that he was going to take a pot shot at the president and succeeded in assassinating the president. That seems an insufficient uh, explanation for us. So therefore, uh, we look for larger, bigger causes which are proportional to the particular event. We have small explanation on ease, in other words. Uh, so that's a second cognitive bias. The third one is the big one, and it's one that uh, researchers point to again and again, and is part of the uh, folk way we talk about um, conspiracy theories, and that is confirmation bias, is that we have a tendency to attribute, um, we, we, tend, we have a tendency to sort of uh, have facts fit our prior preconceptions. We're looking for um, events in the world, uh, particular processes in the world, which confirm what it is we already believe. This is sometimes described as motivated reasoning. We are, uh, we have a particular side. We are uh, supporting a particular a candidate or a particular part of a particular nation, and therefore we tend to be. Uh, much easier on that candidate and or nation and we tend to attribute a, a lot more um, kind of nefarious uh, activities or we're a lot more critical of those that are not candidates that we're supporting or a nation which is not uh, our nation or a nation which is a, uh, an enemy nation. Um, what this all means is that factual correction can be difficult. In fact, there's research by psychologists which show that we actually reward ourselves when we face aberrant, challenging information. We reward ourselves by creatively coming up with explanations which confirm our priors. Um, and so therefore, uh, in effect, uh, when you study political partisans, uh, it is um, in part, this is a kind of a very important process. It is one where um, the, the, you're so sort of entrenched in a particular position that uh, any challenging information is an information that you want to disarm, you want to deflect, you want to contextualize, you want to negate. Uh, and that, that is absolutely central to the, uh, the continuation of particular uh, um, discourses and positions and identities um, in the face of contradictory evidence. The truth becomes partisan, in other words. Um, so that's a, 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 an important um, sort of contextualization of uh, conspiracy theories. So our stereotype of conspiracy theorists as crazy people who are always assuming that nothing happens by accident is, is wrong. Uh, I, Michael Billig uh, suggested it is easy to overemphasize conspiracy theories, uh, eccentricities at the expense of noticing what is psychologically commonplace. Uh, and I mentioned that Botherton describes us as natural born conspiracy theorists. Okay, so what does this mean then in terms of how we study conspiracy theories? Well, there are different types of conspiracy theories. Uh, when we use the frame conspiracy theories, we often go to a generic eccentric conspiracy theories. And there are 
uh, the, this is a particular class of their uh, of its own. It's the, the sort of classic stories about aliens and assassinations and viruses and immigrants and masons and Illuminati and Pope and the CIA and the KGB and uh, hidden actors. These are sort of kind of cla- Area Fifty Four. These are classic uh, um, stories, which are generic conspiracy theories, and they tend to be. Um, sort of nonpartisan in, in certain uh, instances. Um, then there is uh, um, a with because researchers have studied people who uh, are promoting these theories. Um, whether there's a question as to whether there is a, is it possible to isolate a particular conspiratorial disposition, a disposition to believe these, and the the answer to that is that it's actually quite very. It's actually very difficult. It's not that one cannot, because there are certain features, psychological features, that characterize those who are predisposed to believe conspiracy theories, generic conspiracy theories. They tend to have a narcissistic, paranoid psychological profile or tend in that particular direction. They tend to be very distrustful of conventional sources of information. So there is a certain psychological profile for generic conspiracy theories that that I describe in the American or uh, Anglosphere context. And then you get to event specific conspiracy theories and there you're moving away from this and you're beginning to go into a domain where um, uh, we're dealing with more commonplace psychological dispositions. So there are uh, two event-specific uh, types of uh, conspiracy theories. Those that deal with shock events, where there is a consideration of, uh, you know, there's a particular event that occurs, it's, uh, it is big, it is shocking, uh, um, and then there are official stories as to what happened, and then uh, there are uh, sort of entrepreneurs of alternative evidence. So 9-11 being an inside job, uh, the CIA being behind the assassination or Cuban uh, immigrants being assass- uh, behind the killing of JFK uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the fall of the, the Soviet Union was also another shock event and has become um, a, a, an event which is ripe for the emergence of conspiracy theories to describe this, uh, this very, very sh- shocking event. Um, then there are particular contentious uh, events, um, which are often very, very political. And, and here that bleeds into partisanship. Um, and the nature of the contentious events often, uh, as to whether a conspiracy theory develops around it, it depends on who the actor is. So we have a third class of conspiracy theories, our actor-specific uh, theories. Uh, are there partisan actors? Uh, is the conspiring group an in-group or out-group? Uh, is it, does it involve a conspiring enemy or friend? So this is the concern with fifth columnists, concern with um, those that are not of one's own party or not of one's own nation or not of one's own religion. Uh, um, those that are seen as sort of threatening others. It is more likely that uh, one will develop conspiracy theories when those actors are out-group actors, when they're not part of us. Uh, When it involves us, uh, there's less disposition to see conspiracy theories or to create conspiracy theories. And the last type are sort of pro and anti-establishment conspiracy theories. Um, they, there are, and it's important to, to note, generally conspiracy theories are seen as anti-establishment, anti-elite, uh, and therefore they would seem to be uh, very much on the fringes challenging the center of power. But you need to also um, sort of critically think about that and how centers of power themselves have used conspiracy theories in order to bolster their own position uh, by promoting particular visions of 
the state being under threat and i mentioned the case uh, of russia here but it's not so only the case this is this is also what uh, characterizes trump too where the uh, even though he's at the very very center of power he sees himself as uh, facing down a deep state conspiracy uh, against him so this brings us to muirhead and rosenblum's book and the title of it a lot of people are saying well I, let's just listen to trump and uh, get a sense of the discourse and how this particular construction characterizes how he talks all the time some people say a lot of people think according to some people you know a lot of people are saying you said about the president he doesn't get it or he gets it better than anybody understands what do you mean by that well there are a lot of people that think maybe he doesn't want to get it a lot of people think maybe he doesn't want to know about it i happen to think that he just doesn't know what he's doing but there are many people that think maybe he doesn't want to get it he doesn't want to see what's really happening why would that be and that could be okay we problem in this country is called muslim we know our current president is one right. you know he's not even an american we need this first significant man first but anyway we have training camps growing where they want to kill us mm -hmm. that's my question when can we get rid of we're going to be looking at a lot of different things and you know a lot of people are saying that and a lot of people are saying that bad things are happening out there we're going to be looking at that and plenty of other things now we've already taken off the sanctions they're already I just stop it there because um, that's a very important moment in the campaign. Um, those of you who are from follow American politics will recall from 2008 um, that a then Republican candidate for president, uh, John McCain, was asked by an audience member about Obama and that he was, uh, according to the audience member, a Muslim. And uh, McCain intervened and uh, stopped the woman, corrected her and said, no, he's a Christian, he's a good family man, we just disagree on uh, policy issues. That was a moment in which um, a particular conspiracy theory was stopped in its tracks. It was not affirmed by, in this case, an epistemic authority uh, in the form of a politician running for president. It was instead um, marginalized, delegitimated. Uh, contrast that to how Trump just answered that particular question in which he affirmed and amplified uh, the particular uh, question, did not correct it. That's the key difference. Uh, uh, that um, Rosenblum and Muirhead point to uh, in this particular book. And it's um, um, a radicalization uh, of discourse that uh, also Benkler and uh, the others want to uh, understand too. You're rich as hell. What, what's going on here? You, that's why I say, I mean, some people say it's worse than stupidity. There's something going on that we don't know about. I mean, honestly. And you almost think it. I'm not saying that, and I'm not a conspiracy person. <laughs> she said, we are. We're saying it. I, half the people in this room are saying it. I'm trying to be a light, you know. I'm just hoping they're just stupid people, okay? asked of me, what do you think of Vince Foster? Uh, I really know nothing about the Vince Foster uh, situation, uh, haven't known anything about it, and somebody asked me the question the other day, and I said that a lot of people are very skeptical as to what happened and how he died. I know nothing about it. Uh, I don't think it's something that, frankly, really, unless some evidence to the contrary of what I've seen comes up, I don't think it's something that should really be part of the campaign. Now, what are the features of the new conspiracism, according to Muirhead and Rosenblum? Well, they argue that the new conspiracism is um, characterized by its lack of theory. 
it involves bold assertions, such as they claim the elections are rigged. And even just one word itself is uh, enough to trigger uh, a conspiracy theory, to prompt it. And it's also characterized by innuendo, the um, notion that something is going on. There is a, a gesturing to the fact that things are hidden and being, uh, being carried out um, behind closed doors, behind um, a veil that uh, people cannot see. It's also characterized by uh, conditionality. And what they mean by this is that um, uh, the conspiracy theory can be disavowed, as we saw uh, with the Trump uh, clip there, where he says, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but a lot of people are saying, or this, may, this particular instance is false, um, the idea that certain uh, Democrats were behind the creation of the violence at Charlottesville between uh, protesters and far-right um, extremists, um, the particular claim that that may be that that conspiracy theory may be false, but it is plausible. So you have this disavowal yet reinscription. So that's what they mean by conditionality there. Um, characterized by verbal gestures. Uh, so the, I, the particular phrases a lot of people are saying, people want to know, etc., etc. By memes and slogans. Well, of course, the slogans from Trump's rallies, lock her up, um, is part of uh, um, um, a conspiracy theory. It's a response to the notion that uh, Hillary Clinton was evil and therefore deserved to be punished uh, and imprisoned for her particular uh, policies. Um, so there's a sloganistic quality to uh, these uh, conspiracy theories. And then they're characterized by repetition um, and uh, this idea of the, them being true enough um, so, and they discuss the Jade Helm exercise in Texas as examples of this. Now, they say that this is without theory, and I think that's an overstatement on their part because there is a theoretical, there, there is a set of explanations behind these, um, these actions, but um, I think they're nevertheless um, uh, useful because what they're arguing is that the classic conspiracy theory was one which was rich in documentation, even though that documentation may have been um, um, sort of deranged and confused. But it was nevertheless, there was this desperate need to present archives and archives and archives uh, to uh, support a position, as opposed to the performance of politic of uh, conspiracy theories in the in the age of Trump, where it's very much about bravado and assertion, uh, and um, there is there's very little behind all of this. There's a uh, it, it's simply gesturing at uh, uh, claims which have no basis in, in reality at all. The new conspiracism is also characterized by an assault on expertise, and this is not new. This is something that we saw with the book Merchants of Doubt. Uh, it, but, and the goal here is to deny the standing uh, of experts, to smear uh, experts and uh, um, so-called elites. In other words, epistemic authorities, people who are trained like historians, uh, like uh, professional journalists, uh, like professional uh, analysts, uh, it is to smear them as having a particular agenda. Uh, the FBI, uh, the CIA, uh, law enforcement agencies uh, writ large, and to deny them standing. So that's another feature of it. Thirdly, uh, they characterize it as be as coming out of a particular partisan penumbra. And what they mean by this is that it's not coming from one particular political party. Rather, it's coming from one faction within one political party. And that is the far-right anti-government activists 
radical uh, anti-government activists who are um, attacking what they see as an oppressive, administrative, bureaucratic state, which is on the verge of taking away their uh, sort of mythical organic rights. Um, so it is, in other words, marinated in a far right uh, political culture. Um, uh, there's a strong tribalistic quality to it. In, in fact, a, a race, uh, this is whiteness uh, and fear of uh, non-whiteness. Um, and there's a populist quality to it also. But it's a populism of the right where the people are considered to be sort of organic uh, ethno-nationalist uh, rather than the diversity of American people. So it, it is a very particularistic understanding of the people. Now, that particular rhetoric, which is uh, not new, and indeed Hofstetter um, addressed it in his book on the paranoid style, that has long been appropriated by corporate power in the United States to uh, undermine regulations and uh, to undermine the, the role of the government in legislating for the public interest. Um, and we have seen that in cases of tobacco, in cases of uh, climate change, uh, in, in cases of uh, dealing with uh, health and safety, um, uh, the gutting of the EPA, the gutting of water standards, uh, air quality and the like. So um, there, this is not something which is solely about true believers who are off the grid. Uh, this is also something that is uh, actually fostered by the center of power itself or a, a key center of power itself. Fourth feature is delegitimation. And um, I think this is the thing that is particularly um, worrisome to Muirhead and Rosenblum. And that is the idea that this is an assault on democracy, that democracy itself and the delegitimation of democracy, uh, democracy itself is the particular product here. Uh, so there's an assault on the norms of legitimate opposition. Uh, in one sense, it is an, a form of anti-politics. It's a rejection of the system, rejection of uh, the, um, the nation's administrative and deliberative bodies. Uh, it, it characterizes them as simply the swamp uh, and therefore um, sets up um, a scenario of power in which a strong man is supposed to rule in the name of the uh, people. Uh, so this is effectively a, a, a discourse which supports authoritarian rule and authoritarian government by a particular charismatic figure. The fifth feature of the new conspiracism is its, emphasis, its deorientation effects. Now, I, what I have added here is the uh, four Ds that have been promoted by ne Ben Nemo, who is a media analyst who was formerly at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and he um, um, gives, uh, in analyzing propaganda, uh, he argues that there you need to look out for four Ds. You need to look out for the dismissal uh, or the insult the distortion, the distraction, and the dismay that characterizes the particular storylines uh, that are produced. Now, he's interested in analyzing Russian propaganda, but this is something that you can also use to analyze political discourse writ large um, as a, a form of conspiracism. Um, and But the secondary disorientation effect is that uh, uh, this creates fatigue, disenchantment, disengagement, uh, escapism and it demobilizes a, a certain segment of the population who turn away in disgust uh, at uh, politics and how politics is being conducted. Now, you can perhaps uh, characterize their argument in terms of a, a grid where you have a, a new conspiracism characterized by a, a very light theory 
uh, where memes and uh, sort of it lives on uh, Twitter and a 140 or 280 character uh, short uh, discursive bites as opposed to a theory heavy old conspiracism. I think that can be overdone that uh, distinction but that's the, their particular argument. And then there's a, another argument between sort of those that are a more of a more paranoid disposition and those that are simply skeptical uh, which is a kind of mainstream uh, human uh, disposition um, and uh, you would place he who shall not be named uh, probably in the uh, upper uh, left hand quadrant here of this um, particular grid now, um, let me note that uh, there is considerable research out there on how um, there's a, disti a distinction between uh, some individuals who are likely to believe in conspiracy theories who are re regardless of their cons uh, partisan nature. So there's certain people that are disposed to con uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, but for many individuals, partisanship remains a powerful explanatory factor. So there, when we are dealing with uh, conspiracy theories, uh, we have to engage with the partisan commitments and the particular priors that uh, um, people bring to an analysis uh, or to a, a situation and uh, to what is going on in the political arena. Um, uh, the argument uh, in uh, a work, Research and Politics, from um, spring of 2018, uh, where you had uh, research by these two uh, uh, political scientists who argue that the inclusion of even a single partisan stimulus within this experiment they, they ran has the power to substantially decrease conspiracy beliefs for members of one party, while increasing belief among members of other party. Indeed, partisan stimulus has the power to activate motivated motivate reasoning. And what they do is they conduct a, an experiment and then they say the Democratic Congress or they say the Republican Congress. And uh, that uh, sets up, that prompts people to um, a particular partisan disposition and Republicans generally will uh, react to that and Democrats will react to that. So uh, partisan cues increases or decreases conspiracy beliefs. So you tend to, in, uh, to uh, it increases beliefs about conspiracies about the other party uh, or uh, it, it decreases it about your own particular party. So conspiracist thinking is embedded within a broader context. And this is the key uh, kind of conclusion here. It is a cultural mode rather than a mental state. Certainly there is a generic uh, conspirat conspiracy theory disposition, but you have to layer in partisanship uh, uh, over that. And there's a, a partisanship is really very, very powerful here. And beyond partisanship, we have uh, commitments to nations, to particular identities, to collective uh, uh, notions of, let's say, whiteness or of uh, Western civilization or, um, you know, NATO and the like. And we're in a larger than in a larger geopolitical field. Um, so therefore, uh, and this is it gets to their, our current context, too, we are more likely to believe uh, that the Russians are conspiring against us than, uh, let's say, our friends, uh, our allies, because uh, of the particular fields that we live in, the socialized um, uh, context within which we make sense of the world. Okay, uh, we will now move on to the second book, uh, which is uh, the book Network Propaganda, and analyze the larger ecosystem which uh, helps uh, explain why it is that we have the particular discourse we have in American political life at this particular moment, the age of Trump as I uh, characterized it. Okay, let me leave it there. Thank you very much.